It's that special time of year when there's a chill in the air and we're all in the mood for a scare. But I bet you're not interested in scares where your candy is concerned. So today, let's break down the environmental impacts of chocolate. But first, some background on chocolate. I'm assuming you all have at least a passing familiarity with this delightful confection, but in case you weren't aware, there are four basic types of chocolate. Unsweetened, dark, milk, and white. Each of these is created using different proportions of cocoa solids and cocoa butter, as well as potential additives like sugar, milk products, vanilla, etc. There's evidence that people may have been consuming food and drinks with chocolate in them as far back as 1900 BCE, meaning that the human taste for chocolate could be around 4,000 years old. So how does chocolate become chocolate? First, cacao trees grow in the understory of tropical rainforests near the equator. The trees produce pods and the cocoa beans are inside these pods. When the pods are ripe, the beans are removed and allowed to slightly ferment before they're ground up and processed into cocoa solids and butter, which then become the primary components for chocolate. I bet you can already tell where a lot of the environmental impacts might come from in the process of creating chocolate. As we've discussed previously, food products that grow on trees can be problematic because trees often require a large amount of resources to grow before they ever produce the target food. But rather than making assumptions about which parts of the process might be problematic, let's get into the science. I was able to find two separate research papers that are life cycle assessments for chocolate. A life cycle assessment, or LCA, is a way of evaluating the environmental impact of something from the extraction of raw materials through processing to consumption, as well as all of the intermediate steps, including end of life or disposal. But because we can't have nice things, these two LCAs do some things differently, meaning they're a little difficult to compare. Care. But I'm going to do my best because you shouldn't have to go through all that mess if I've already read them. The LCA published in 2009 focused on chocolate produced in Ghana. Even though cacao trees, Theobroma cacao, are native to South America, approximately two-thirds of the world's cocoa beans are now produced in Western Africa. The other LCA, published in 2017, focused on dark chocolate produced in Italy using cocoa beans from Peru. You can probably already see how different these two studies are, as well as how limited they are. The 2009 study only examines the environmental impacts of the cocoa production and processing, while the 2017 study examines the environmental impacts of cocoa production as well as the environmental impacts of the sugar and packaging involved in creating the final chocolate product. That being said, sugar and packaging are their own separate issues, so we can tackle those topics in future videos. And for what it's worth, one of the few things these two LCAs could agree on was that the production of cocoa beans is the most environmentally taxing part of the process, so let's just talk about that for now. As I previously mentioned, cacao trees can only grow in certain conditions, latitudes close to the equator with relatively high temperatures and rainfall. These limitations mean that farmers might struggle to produce enough cocoa to keep up with global demands without running out of land. There are two basic strategies for cocoa farming. One looks very much like other crop farming. Cacao trees are planted in rows in open fields fields in full sun. This strategy causes the trees to grow more pods and more beans, which means increased productivity to meet demand. However, the full sun strategy does have some downsides. Since it creates an unnatural monoculture, cacao trees planted in full sun are more sensitive to attacks by pest insects and crowding by weeds. And as with most other monocultures, these cacao trees also require large inputs of chemical pesticides and fertilizers, as well as water. And with those those inputs come lots of environmental issues. Runoff of synthetic fertilizers into waterways can lead to eutrophication, or blooms of algae, and both synthetic pesticides and fertilizers can contribute to general water toxicity for both humans and animals, not to mention that the production and application of these chemicals onto the land can contribute to global climate change. It's important to remember that cacao trees can only grow in tropical regions, because this full sun monoculture strategy also winds 
winds up endangering native tropical rainforests, which are often cut down and destroyed in order to make room for these full sun farms. However, there is an alternative. This shouldn't come as a surprise, but people have been farming cacao in South America, where it's native, for thousands of years. So the traditional method of cacao farming is something we should also consider. The traditional South American strategy for cacao farming is called cabrucagem, or forest farming. In cabrucagem, the farmers leave most of the overstory trees in place and plant their cacao trees underneath. While this does wind up disturbing the rainforest understory, it does keep much of the valuable biodiversity of the region, as well as many of the functions and ecosystem services provided by rainforests. Forest farming has lower cacao productivity than full sun farming, but it also has lower amounts of insect pests and weeds, and it requires fewer inputs of water and synthetic fertilizer. Overall, this traditional strategy for cacao farming can be better for the environment. So, as per usual, I'm not going to tell you what to do when it comes to your own personal relationship with chocolate. I'm just here to give you information so that you can be an educated consumer. However, I will mention that the full sun farming strategy seems to be more prevalent with chocolate coming from Africa, so there's some food for thought. If you want your chocolate eating to have a lower impact on the environment, consider searching for brands that source their chocolate from shade farming producers. And as sugar and milk additives can create yet another layer of environmental issues, eating dark chocolate could be better for the environment than white or milk chocolate. So how do you feel about chocolate now? Are you going to be making any changes to the kind of chocolate you buy? What's your favorite Halloween candy? I'd love to hear your thoughts down in the comments. Special thanks to my friend Nancy Mirelli for the photos of cacao used in this video. You can find more of Nancy's work at Cybugs on YouTube. If you liked this video, don't forget to like it. If you didn't like this video, please share it with someone who would. And if you'd like to support The Roving Naturalist, remember to hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon. Then go check out my Patreon page. You can also follow me on Twitter and Instagram. As always, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.